So, uh, to pick up then, I guess, on, on some of the threads uh, that we've already spoken about this morning, um, as Richard mentioned, uh, salt is an enormous amount of applications. And as Chris has mentioned, salt is enormously important. Well, for Ireland, it remained enormously important all the way into the 20th century. Uh, for the very simple reason um, that we just never industrialized on the same scale as Britain. And as a result, our economy was so much more reliant on uh, food, agriculture, agricultural exports. So when I'm speaking about salt today, I'm really only going to be concentrating on the use of salt as a preservative for our key products, which were fish and meat and dairy products, particularly into the post-medieval uh, period. As such, salt then acts as a, something of a proxy for understanding the Irish economy as it emerges through uh, the post-medieval period, um, as well as some of the opportunities um, that it was undoubtedly offered uh, by new networks that it had access to, particularly across the Atlantic world and in the Atlantic and, uh, and with Britain's imperial networks. So I've been working for the past number of years on uh, Archaeology of Salt project um, in Ireland. And I'll speak a little bit about some of the things that we've been looking at um, in this project today. Um, salt had never really been a very focused subject of archaeological inquiry as a particular theme in Ireland for reasons which will become abundantly clear in a moment. Um, so we decided to do a, a rapid national survey to try and understand where sites were where salt was being produced and what kind of field signatures um, they had, what was, what was their archaeological expression. Um, then to choose a flagship site for a bit more concentrated work and excavation. And hopefully in doing so, um, tap into some uh, other uh, relationships with other industries and broader themes which were affecting the country uh, in this period. So, as a context, because I'm going to talk really just about the post-medieval period, um, but it won't take me long to, <laughs> to skirt the context um, for why Irish salt has not been a distinct theme of inquiry. Because there's very, very little evidence. Even in the prehistoric period, very little of that kind of bricketage that you have in Britain that we see in continental Europe. Um, very fragmentary early medieval references. If you go to the early, early Irish law texts, the sign of a prosperous household is a bag of wheat, a bag of malt, and a bag of salt. But as to how it was produced, there is no archaeological evidence. And it's only after the Anglo-Norman uh, invasion uh, in 1177 that we begin to see references to the equipment associated with salt making, pans and things like that, um, as well as uh, you know, these kind of granges that are clearly um, uh, uh, granted um, for the production of salt. We also have some of the shipping records coming into view in this period um, and we can discern there that salt is coming either being transshipped perhaps through England but coming directly from uh, Brittany and Spain as well. So we begin to at least see evidence of the importation of salt. By the 16th century then Ireland has an established trade in salted beef and hides in particular. Um, and it's worth saying that th these records that I'm talking about here, these medieval records, are of course predominantly produced by the English controlled parts of Ireland. So the Western Gaelic seaboard had direct contacts with Italy, Spain and France in this period, but of course um, didn't leave uh, the same uh, scale of records um, behind them. Consequently, the degree to which indigenous salt making was carried out in Ireland in this period is really not well known or appreciated and the overriding uh, impression is that our salt was simply imported all the time. Uh, in the terms of sources that we have um, for our own requirements, uh, rock salt, um, yes we do have geological sources of rock salt, the only problem was it wasn't discovered until 1850, extraordinarily late. But of course when I say it wasn't discovered, if you look at the place name evidence, and you look at other sources of evidence, you can clearly see that the locals knew. But why tell the landlord, in typical Irish, <laughs> because it was no benefit to them, was it? You know? uh, but it was discovered officially in 1850. Uh, and then there's seawater, and as an island, of course, you've got a lot of seawater. Um, so of the common processes that have been mentioned this morning, we have tried to remain sensitive to processes like sleaching and cellaring, but so far have not made definitive identification and as a result I'll mainly be talking then about direct 
boiling and the use of pans. So to begin with, just to, uh, to give you a kind of a summary of the trajectory then of um, uh, salt making in Ireland um, and the, the our kind of national survey, um, our major impediment uh, in the post-medieval period is a lack of fuel, uh, it being such a hungry process for fuel. Um, and this is one of the reasons it's commonly cited why we didn't industrialise in the way that Britain did, because we didn't have the raw material of industry in the form of coal. So here's Irish coal fields. As you can see, many of them are slightly inland. Um, they weren't extensive and they weren't regarded as being of great quality. But if you look at the salt works, they're all around the coast in this period, as you would expect when they're using seawater. So this was a major, uh, major difficulty. Nevertheless, we do have some 17th century sites and coal still comes into this because this is a site um, right down here in the southeast corner, opposite Wales, uh, which had long standing ever since the Anglo Norman invasion or Anglo Cambrian, as it's sometimes called, invasion, had connections through Hookhead Lighthouse, which was established by William the Marshal in the 13th century. It's one of the longest continuously used lighthouses in the world. And they were bringing in Welsh coal to burn the lighthouse. And it was later on another Welsh man. Uh, William Mansell, who married into a local family, who revived, who had connections in Penrhys and possibly the, co the salt works at Port Einan, a well-known 16th century one, um, who uh, established um, a site uh, down here at Slade. Um, you can see we've, uh, this is our sketch map, Pan's house, the windmill, stove house and cistern. So just ignore the nice 19th century key and the lovely 15th century tower house. It's this rather ugly um, range of buildings here. Um, the interior, stone built, corbelled ceilings with earth over the top, a long range of um, storehouses. Uh, this is the pan house, again, corbelled ceiling up to a circular aperture in the roof to let smoke steam escape scar of the cistern at a slightly later phase of salt working in this site um, as well here. The real turnaround for the industry came in 1702 with an act of parliament which advantaged uh, Irish salt production by uh, lifting uh, the tax on rock salt being imported into the country. Okay? Now, I should pause here and explain that ever since the early 17th century, there had been uh, debates about what to do with Ireland and how much to stimulate its economy or not uh, in Westminster. This was not a deliberate attempt to, s to stimulate the Irish economy. This was rather an oversight, right? Which a few decades later was picked up and exploited to the hilt by Irish salt makers. Uh, and uh, when I'm delivering this lecture at home, I usually pause at this point and feign wonderment that Westminster would ever ignore the circumstances of Ireland when designing legislation, international <laughs> agreements, protocols, or Irish sea borders, but we are where we are, you know. Um, regardless of how this occurred, uh, we immediately, or in the couple of decades it takes, we begin to see uh, rock salt imports uh, uh, take off and then doubling again by the end of the century and that clearly has an effect on the amount of salt manufactories set up during this period. Simply made the entire process of producing salt that much more fuel efficient, that much more economically viable. Uh, we get peat in New Stone, Western counties, we get small isolated ones um, as well. By happy coincidence we're also seeing Ireland which had some of its um, direct contact, contacts with the continent cut off at the end of the 16th century. Um, in the 18th century, being able to use some of Britain's imperial networks as opening new markets for salt um, abroad. But there's also illegal uh, smuggling too. And this from uh, Lord Dundonald here at the end of the 18th century, he estimated that three quarters of Western Scotland was supplied by smuggled Irish salt. This is an exaggeration. It's nothing like this, uh, but nevertheless, there were a number of very, very active and well-organized smuggling companies, they called themselves, because they want to sound respectable, in uh, Antrim, the Isle of Man, Kintar, Sanda, out as far as Isle in this period. So what does this look like on the ground? Well, some of them are quite literally cottage industries. In some of the rural areas, you get you know, domestic quarters here with a kind of an annex on the end which doesn't resemble anything like 
uh, 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 kind of domestic quarters. Um, this site here, Chuck and Talon, literally the salt house in Galway, uh, which from a distance looks like any other abandoned cottage, but when you go inside, none of the kind of domestic fireplaces and uh, domestic um, arrangements. There are also, of course, ones springing up in uh, urban areas as well. This is a late medieval house, um, which has served numerous functions uh, through its existence. It was a salt works at one stage. And also um, maybe facilities that are slightly more purpose built, like this one in Cork, warehouse facade with a low range in behind where salt was produced. Indeed, Cork on the south coast is the Irish salt city par excellence. And that's absolutely because of those uh, British colonial uh, opportunities in the Caribbean in particular. So ships coming out of Liverpool, coming out of Bristol, stopping off at Cork, huge harbour, before they make that transatlantic trip uh, across. <coughs> and uh, consequently, and unsurprisingly, some of these facilities are simply larger in scale now, particularly where um, they are in port cities. And even some of the rural ones um, are um, enlarged as well, as we'll see in a moment. Um, a very common thing where salt works do survive is to be able to identify um, accommodation. So clearly, this is a valuable commodity. You want to protect it. Security is paramount. Um, you're protecting both the salt and, I suspect, the fuel as well. Um, and we sometimes find um, the uh, salt master's house appended right to the works themselves. So this is a, in Sligo, this is the four house, the pan's house, and this is the dwelling. Two-story house, um, red brick in the fireplace, red brick in the window surrounds. I mean, for context, uh, at this period, this is late 18th century, uh, most houses in the Irish countryside are single story. This is a two-story house like a landlord would have with this red brick, which, wasn't, which didn't feature particularly heavy, heavily in uh, Irish houses in this period either. So it speaks to the status, as Chris mentioned earlier, of the, the salt master. On the other hand, some of them are a little more than one-room cabins. Uh, and very, very humble. Although that said, in the case of this particular site, about 200 yards north, there's another salt works that the family built as they were doing well, and appended to that is a two-story house. Uh, part of this family then moved through social scale. One part of the family went on to be clerics, and the other uh, uh, part of the family followed those transatlantic connections to the Caribbean and worked in plantations making salt there. So they're following some of these trading networks as well. Um, one Irish agriculture, despite the fact that we relied on it so heavily in this period, wasn't well thought of by agricultural commentators. But either, even Arthur Young had to admit that Ireland was very, very good in terms of the production of lime. And a very common aspect of the Irish salt making business was to try and, uh, as a drive for fuel efficiency, was to try and combine salt making with some of these other industrial processes, particularly lime. And we tried to remain sensitive then to lime kilns in the vicinity of salt working sites. Um, it seems that in most cases, um, that whatever way the pans were established above the flue, presumably, uh, it was uh, reasonably ephemeral in terms of they could be removed quite easily. There's the odd fitting and bits and pieces like that. At this site in Mallow, there's uh, an iron lining around the top of the flue, which was speculated. Uh, by the archaeologist who did the survey that um, this might have been some kind of remains of an attempt um, to have some kind of pan or basin arrangement um, toward the top of it. It seems to have been very, very common um, across the country. And the other uh, combination process is kelp, uh, which was burnt widely on, on all Atlantic coasts of Ireland in this period. Um, the vast majority, though, of kelp kilns in rural districts are very, very small, and consequently, I don't really think we could expect an awful lot of salt production out of these, albeit there were a few which were established in a slightly larger um, scale. So that brings me on. Um, second half of this talk really is about our flagship site, which is at a place called Ballycastle in the northeastern promontory of Ireland, um, right beside that promontory. Very clear views on, a, on fine weather across the Kintyre and Isle and Jura can be seen uh, beyond Rathlin Island. The reason we chose it is salt was being made here uh, from the 17th century. It's first mentioned in 1629 right through to the 1820s. It was owned by Lord Antrim um, in the beginning. Uh, he was kind of unique being a 
descendant of um, you know, Gaelic lord, held on to his Catholicism, even through the plantation of Ulster and the influx of Protestant settlers. Um, uh, so he had control of this area and then subsequently to that he leased it out to a Dublin-based company and then a series of individual entrepreneurs. And its position here is entirely because of the coal deposits in these cliffs to the rear, um, conveniently sited on the coast. So uh, mid 17th century map, two salt pans are labelled here. And uh, indeed when we located them, uh, the 17th century map was really quite is reasonably accurate as you could expect. To that we're adding a third site, and this is a later one. It's established around 1720, 1730, and it's in uh, production until 1820. The smoking gun <laughs> is something you're very familiar with in Scotland. The seawater reservoir or bucket pot carved into the sandstone foreshore here. Um, we found this and it took a look around the local area. This is an active colliery to the rear, or it was an active colliery to the rear, and there's a lot of spoil has come down slope here, but we noticed this kind of V-shaped notch uh, just above the beach, and we reasoned that there must have been something upstanding to arrest the migration of that spoil down slope and fan out on either side. So we did the test trench in there, and we were absolutely delighted to come across the remains of the building. Um, but our smugness was slightly short-lived because <laughs> I'm afraid during the few weeks that we excavated this structure, it became clear that uh, the main business end of um, the salt works is actually still hidden in the hill here. But this is sometimes what you have to do in archaeology, as you know. Uh, <laughs> you have to uh, dig just to establish that you're digging in the wrong place. Anyway, um, what we have here you can see that this wall extended and then we tried to pick it up here but didn't and then put a test trench in here and found, like you have at Brora, nice flagstones, which is the actual interior of the building where the business end of things went on. And this is a very roughly built small annex room uh, that, uh, that we uncovered here. Uh, bottom of it, no sign of actual direct evidence for salt making, huge amounts of crushed coal. Four weeks digging out a coal shed, it turned out. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, um, certainly evidence of fuel slag. So there's clearly industrial activity and burning happening close by. Um, some of the finds then repurposed elements that came from the salt works itself, like this uh, sandstone block, still chisel marks um, on the edge of it, possibly a dripstone or something of that nature from the main works, which broke and was repurposed. Uh, button from later on. Uh, on the site um, and this is, I need to speak to somebody at the museum on this because it's a broken flint which has a facet in here and then has been nipped along the edge, has been worked along the edge. It's possibly a broken gun flint. I know this is a very bad picture of it. Um, there is documented conflict occurring at this site uh, in the 17th century. And then there's a cornstone, you can see it in situ, just where we're connecting on to the main part of the building. Um, this raised questions about salt making and how crude it was on the site. I mean, normally crystals, as you know, are controlled by controlling the boiling process. Uh, why was this stone brought in here and introduced? Is this part, uh, was this, that it has some part to play, presumably, in producing the kind of salt that they wanted? Uh, subsequently, I have found references to grindstones and other sites, so maybe this isn't as atypical as we suspected. Because, I mean, in general, this 17th century site, um, in comparison, say, with Brora and the very fine stonework you have, it's got none of that at all. It's really very, very crude. OK, I'm just going to fast forward then to uh, the kind of final phase of salt making on site. This is a colliery map from the early 19th century. And tucked down in the corner is the salt pans, uh, which were established probably in the 1720s. And you can see the slightly more formal basis here. Iron Gate, a uh, series of uh, buildings around what is possibly a central courtyard. Structure uh, over here with what looks like a pipe heading to this building. Okay. So we went in and did some survey work in here. And sure enough, there our square structure is a bucket pot uh, with its channel, like to see. Um, 
Unfortunately, a lot of the sandstone in here had been quarried out to repair the church in the later uh, 19th century. But the most remarkable discovery was the salt pan, was the wrought iron pan itself lying on the shore. So um, th this very flimsy wall had been inundated numerous times. The back had been broken of the pan here, really, as we found it. Um, and so this became all of a sudden a, a rescue excavation as much as a research one. But we decided the best thing to do was to clean all of this back and take a look at the pan recorded properly. And then uh, we finished on site by building an entirely new wall around here to try and protect it. So this is what it looked like when it was cleaned up. Uh, bucket pot over here. This is the original wall of the works, which must have extended through here and around um, the pan. Um, Taking a look at it then, it appears to have been constructed around a kind of central uh, brace, two braces along this way, and then um, kind of filled in almost in quarters in towards uh, their respective um, centres. And it's pretty square, it's about five metres by five metres or something like that. A um, little bit of a look at the plinth that it rests on too. Came as no surprise, came as no surprise at all. Um, given how well documented it is by Chris and others about how uh, hard salt making was on the pans to find square patches and bars uh, to, uh, showing active repair was going on here on site. And this is just a look underneath then with the brick flared out running underneath and then cobbles at the base of the ash pit running through there too. So we did some um, back of a cigarette packet calculations. We weren't sure. We, it's a very strange, uh, superficially it's very strange to have bucket pots here. It's quite a narrow tidal range in Irish terms and it was really strange we didn't have them on the west coast where they could have been really useful. But we looked at the volumes of them anyway. We didn't have the 17th century pans. We used uh, Henry Calmetter's observations in Scotland here um, just, as a, just a, as an exercise and we found that in actual fact the 17th century uh, bucket pots would have been large enough to supply pans based on Calmetter's observations. The only problem is by the later 17th century, the, there's a reference to four fires. So maybe two pans on each of these sites. And in that case, at least one of these sites, one of these bucket pots would have really struggled to have supplied adequate amounts um, of seawater. The final bucket pot is twice the size and had no such difficulties therefore. In fact, it could have supplied uh, the excavated pan uh, with enough seawater over 24 hours without even needing a tidal refill, which very strongly suggests, of course, that there was more than one pan on site here, two, maybe three. So in conclusion then, uh, I think what the Ballycastle site uh, demonstrates to us is the physical expansion of the industry about the kind of opportunities which were afforded by that new legislation, uh, but also uh, coincidentally, some of the new market opportunities uh, which occurred as well. And the other quite nice thing coming into view in the 18th century in a documentary sense is the exchange of specialised information with individuals in Dublin and with British individuals as well in order to try to set the pans up uh, on a much more modern uh, and more efficient uh, footing by this point. We also see its effect on local infrastructure. There's a tramway built out to a new harbour with a glass house and other industries uh, in the centre of town as well. So everything seems to be developing quite well. But despite that, the salt works closed down in the 1820s in the same decade that that tax advantage was abolished for Ireland. And the general received wisdom is that the salt industry goes into decline in Ireland um, from that date on. In actual fact, the uh, project found that this is not the case at all. Salt manufactories were established in Ireland all the way through the 19th century, right to the end of the 19th century. It's just that they were only really established in the larger port cities. They were established on a much larger scale and they were able to tap into specialisms that those port cities were engaged in. So for example, Cork had the largest butter market in the world by the end of the 19th century and a lot of the city's uh, manufactories were set up with that in mind. So smaller, even though they had been expanded, smaller manufactories like Ballycastle and a lot of other rural and isolated ones went to the wall. Thank you all.